Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about um, identity, obviously. So what interests me about identity is creating decentralized identity systems that work for everyone. Um, and I'll just interrupt my own talk for a brief second because if you, if you go and download the Uport app in the Play Store or App Store right now and set up a quick Uport identity, I will issue you all a certificate of attendance at the Blockchain uh, Africa Conference 2018 at the end of the talk. So while you should obviously be focused 100% on me, um, <laughs> at the same time, you're allowed to fiddle a bit with your phone and get your identity set up on Uport. All right. Now we got that over. What is identity? There's a lot of people who have different ideas about what identity is, and it really it depends who you ask. Uh, so identity, is it, is it an identity card? This is one thing that a lot of people talk about when they talk about identity, a state-issued ID. Or is it a, you know, if you, if you talk to someone who's a system administrator or a CIO, identity for them is obviously something about a record in an active directory. Is it your Facebook profile? Or uh, is it all to do about knowing your customer? Uh, there's this odd shadowy organization called the FATF based in France that created these mythical rules that we all have to obey by around the world. So identity for a lot of people in the blockchain space is all about obeying these rules or various local reinterpretations of them. But all of those things, are they actually identity, or are they just facets of identity? So I'd say none of them are identity itself. Your identity card is not you, and identity is about you. The identity card is a representation. It's the government saying who you are. So identity is about you, and it's also about your relationships, because uh, that, that's actually how we use identity. So in the example of a state-issued identity, it's about your relationship with the government. So the government is issuing you this identity. It's also about reputation. And this is one of the places where I think identity can really be useful of helping formalize the informal economy, because we can help build up a new kind of user-controlled reputation system that's built on your identity that you control. So, simple example. Identity is, I should really test these kinds of slides out on Windows before I, I send them. <laughs> Everything looks weird. But, um, so apologize for formatting issues. But, um, so me telling you my name, that's me making an identity statement. And most of the aspects of identity we, we talk about today is basically statement or claims about identity. So I claim to be Pele Brengard, and um, it could also meet, it could be me telling my bank my name. Now the bank isn't necessarily going to just believe in me. So luckily we have uh, a government office who can also issue my, me a identity card that I can use to essentially let the government tell the bank who I am. So essentially, identity is all about these relationships and claims. But identity is also dynamic. It's not just static stuff like what's my name, what's my identity number. It's also about transactions and all kinds of things that we do. So if you're an Uber driver, part of your identity is your, is your reputation score. Uh, and uh, if you have credit, your credit history is part of your identity. We have all of these fantastic transactions on the blockchain. They should also kind of form part of your identity if you choose them, if you want them to. <laughs> a lot of people don't necessarily want that. Um, so it could also be memberships in, in like a stock sale, uh, which I've learned about recently here in, in South Africa, or chamas that they have in Kenya, which I know a little bit more about. But these are informal savings and loans and investment groups in, I have no idea about the numbers here in South Africa, but I believe that there's about 100,000 of them in Kenya. 
a sizable amount of people they do their savings through these informal groups, yet they have no way of documenting this relationship, bringing this into their financial history. So this formatting is driving me nuts, but anyway, <laughs> identity is a valuable asset that we all have. And it's, you can look at it as identity is like the basis of the capital that we all have. The Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto, he talks about that the poor in the, in, around the world actually has a lot of capital. He calls it debt capital because there's no really good way of documenting it. And he claims that's one of the largest problems of poverty, that, that documentation of the, of the capital that they have is, is impossible. So I also see the same thing with identity. So if you're undocumented, you may you have an identity, but you have no real way of sharing it, getting advantage from it. Um, and all the valuable parts of identities, the actual capital, the assets, the people that are making money from our identity, is not us. It's all controlled by silos. And there are many kinds of silos. Um, so there's governments. So Republic of South Africa, they have an identity silo that issues this national ID card. Um, Brazil, the government, they have, I can't remember, it's, it's four or six competing national identity silos. So essentially different institutions issue different national ID systems and they are very, very competitive. They don't want to interact with each other, so they are silos. So you need to be registered to be part of each silo. We can also talk about immigrants. Immigrants, they may have an ID from a, another government-owned silo. So this, it's a kind of a broken system. It works for people who are very static in one place. It works if there is a very efficient government. It doesn't work that well if there's an inefficient government um, or for people that move around a lot. Facebook is probably the biggest worldwide identity silo at the moment. They know everything about every, maybe not about your financial transactions, but they know everything else. And they make money by, you can go in here and here I attempted to set up an ad to reach people interested in Ethereum uh, in Johannesburg. And so this will reach about 95,000 people, they think. Um, so every time you see an ad, and Facebook, they are actually making money out of your identity, and you're not making money from it. So you, that's how they pay for the services. Of course, you get, you know, you get to share pictures with your friends and stuff like that. That's that's how that's the payment that you get for this. The other large group of identity silos, I've I've said it here as a single one, but there are a lot of of what I call dark nets, which is basically bank run. Uh, networks that are gated off through different kinds of uh, identity. So credit card number is a is a identity issued by one of these financial dark nets. You don't really know what's going on inside. No one knows. But there are very strong limits on who's on it. Identi identity is a very important part of it. The reason they have gatekeepers is to guarantee that everyone on it has gone through KYC. Credit agencies, um, I don't know how much they are in use here in South Africa, but in the US, it's this is basically the real identity system in the US for any kind of financial identity. Uh, and they're very useful, and they actually do provide us some value, because without them, we couldn't get credit. Um, that's the most important value we get. So there is some return here, but they know a lot about us and they're not all necessarily always that good at keeping the data safe so last year there was a big breach with 147.9 million americans that lost their data because of this equifax breach similar things are happening around the world so i believe the solution is decentralized identity uh, and it's all about taking back control Identity is about you. So you should create and issue your identity. Your identity should not be issued by anyone else. And um, this will let the user see 
all the value that their identity has um, that has previously been trapped in all of these silos. Or for a lot of people, they haven't even gained, gained access to these silos, so they just haven't had any kind of value at all. It allows them to control the data and share the data with whoever they want to share the data with. And this is also actually a benefit for businesses, for consumers of this identity data. Because the problem with silos is that they just don't show the full picture. A, a, silo, a silo can show you exactly a very narrow slice of a person's life, of your identity. Um, so as an example, um, oh god, that's completely hopeless. Um, any, <laughs> anyway, I'll try, I'll try and walk, walk through it. This is a kind of a simulation of different identities all kind of interacting together in daily life. Um, there are different people here. These blobs are people. And uh, this blob is a bank. There's a business, etc. And these different lines mean different things. So these have social networks between each other, people that know each other. This person interacts with the shop. Some of these people have bank accounts. And, and the yellow lines, because we're at a blockchain conference and, you know, are basically blockchain transactions. So this is kind of the reality of a simulated identity network. No actual identities were harmed creating this diagram. So this is, if you, if you look at Facebook or a social network, this is the information you get from it. And this is really useful information. But you don't get the full picture. You don't get any financial information here, for example. You just get who people know, what their interests are. The banking darknet, they know even less. They just know about your financial transactions. The blockchain, we just see a you know, bunch of transactions moving between addresses. All of these addresses re represent, of course, businesses and people. And we don't actually want people's names and identity linked publicly on the blockchain. However, if you wanted to share it, you should be able to do so. So in a self-sovereign world or decentralized identity where the user has control of his own identity, he has all of this information. He has it on his phone. He has complete control over it. So if, he, if a business wants to provide him some kind of service and, in re and to do that, they're asking for specific data. He can provide them the full picture about him. And that's actually really, really valuable for businesses. And it's really, really valuable for the person as well. Because he also knows that this is information I'm just sharing with him. It's not being shared into, into some large database that will be hacked. Another example, here we have a person who likes Ethereum, definitely Ethereum a lot, uh, sending these transactions through. And he can prove this, and he can also prove that he also has some connections with the bank and those kinds of things. So this could be used for, a, for building a, a financial history, a credit history. Um, so Uport is our solution for solving this problem. Um, Uport is a project at Consensus, uh, which is a large group of, of like about 700, you said, 700 um, Ethereum pirates, ragtag bag of, uh, of blockchain uh, mavericks all around the world. And Uport is a group within Consensus that we started about two years ago to build a decentralized, self-sovereign these are all buzzwords, I apologize, but identity system. Essentially, it's all about giving the user control of their identity. Uh, so we're, we build an Ethereum, and we use Ethereum as the backing for the basic identity data. And uh, before I go to the screen, we are part of the Decentralized Identity Foundation, which is a new standards group, and we've been working with them. We're one of the founders of it, working with Sovereign, Microsoft and a lot of other companies on trying to build these standards to allow uh, users to take control of their identity. And there's interop between identities built on Ethereum, like Uport, and there's some other, other startups that are creating other kinds of compatible protocols using other uh, blockchains. I think there's one called Bitcoin uh, that, that some of them use. I'm not quite sure about it, but obviously Ethereum is the way to go. So that's what we're doing. 
um, our platform, and I don't expect you guys to see everything here, but I'll just briefly talk about, we have these protocols that are, are part of the standard that we're building with, with the Decentralized Identity Foundation. So we have an identity protocol, and that's just basically what is, an, what is a, how do you identify someone or a business? It's just a kind of like a URL for a, for a person. And with that URL, you don't actually get any private information from them, but with that, you can look up a public key and that allows us to go in and make these claims. I can make these claims about myself. I can make claims about other people. I can share these claims. I can request claims. So this is all about a standard data sharing protocol. And none of this lives on the blockchain, but it is every single um, message here is signed and verified via the blockchain. So a lot of people, when they hear about identity on blockchain, they think, oh man, I'm gonna have to post my Tinder profile on, on Ethereum, you know, that's scary. And that's not what this is about. <laughs> so this is about just having public keys in a way. So we're using the blockchain as a PKI system that's completely decentralized without any certifying authorities or strange certificates. Yeah, PKI. Oh, no, what PKI is, yes. Public key infrastructure, this is how almost all the digital um, certificates are issued, all the smart cards and stuff like that today, they are issued using these ancient government created standards called X509s and they're horrible. Um, and this is not horrible, promise me. You can look at it, I'll explain why it's not horrible after. Um, so we have a smart contract layer that where we go in and actually we can go in and, and manage a user's identities via smart contract or I should say the user manages his own identity via smart contract. There's a public claims registry. Most claims should be private, but every now and again, there are some kinds of claims that you want to have public. And this is now something you can use for writing smart contracts that can ensure someone who's gone through some kind of identity process can access this particular, this particular uh, app or smart contract. Identity manager is a very sophisticated access control module that we have, it's also smart contract, but it lets us do things like recovery, multiple devices, delegating, um, delegating keys to, to some other authority for a temporary period. Several microservices that we have where, um, that help developers to go, uh, to communicate with the user's mobile phone. And we also fuel Ethereum transactions. So, your users, if you're just writing Ethereum apps, if you use the Uport app, we will automatically pave the gas for your for your app. So, uh, and we think this is, while it's not directly a identity thing, getting users into your apps is a really important part. And one of the biggest stumbling blocks for Ethereum is getting gas for initial users. We have a bunch of libraries, most important one being Uport Connects, which is how you go in and add Uport support to your apps. And for end users, a, a mobile wallet, which hopefully you've all downloaded now. I'm pretty sure you have. Um, there are various other ways of managing identities for organizations and apps. So um, this is the mobile wallet. It's intentionally kept very boring. This is not meant to be a, a destination app. This is not, we're not trying to get you to open it up 20 times a day, you know. So it just has some basic information. You can see your verifications, which is these verified credentials that you store that have been issued to you. And then a list of Ethereum accounts that you have. You can send, as a developer, you can send an Ethereum transaction request to, directly as a push notification to the phone. And they, so they can interact very easily with your Ethereum apps. And uh, they just hit approve and it gets sent signed and sent onto the blockchain. We also have a very new feature. It's, it will be in the next release, not the one you've all downloaded right now, but the one you'll get next week. Um, we'll have this in. It's a way of automatically handling account management for on-chain apps. And this is a really important aspect of, of blockchain because most users, they don't quite understand that the data is, is um, if, it's all public on the blockchain. 
So you need a way to be able to separate it into different accounts and the user shouldn't have to go in and know which account he uses for what. So this will automatically manage that. Um, but what I'm really excited about besides the Ethereum part is this concept of, we're calling it verifications here, but you'll hear verified credential or attestations or certificates. We're still trying to find the right, right word. You know, when you, Working with new technology, it's really, really difficult naming things because all of these terms, they actually mean something else from previous generations of technology. But these are a list of verifications that I have issued. One is a ticket, so it's not even an identity verification. It says this ticket is, is valid for some events. Here is a uh, certificate of attendance. Here is an actual identity verification. Um, certificate which or verification which is links where we did a verification of my passport and this was then issued automatically issued to me this is just a we're doing an internal pilot on 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 verifying identity within the app using a passport uh it's just going to be an internal thing because really we want to co-op we want to work with existing financial pro providers or identity providers around the world to do this um so don't expect to see this anytime soon, but, but anyone could go in and issue these kinds of verifications. This is the sharing part, which we in identity speak call selective disclosure, but really for most people, it's just, just like when you log in with Facebook. So the app asks for some information, and this could be, this is all self-signed information, self my own claims, but they could also ask for a particular verification issued by a particular authority uh, or, or a kind of verification. And the user can then decide, do I want to provide this to them or not? So this, this screen here is absolutely key. It's, this is the point where the user goes in and takes control. Um, I don't really need this slide now because I know you've all downloaded the app by now. Um, if you're a developer, um, it's, it's really easy to go in and ask a user for their credentials and also certify credentials. It's literally, I told someone last night, it was like you could do it in three lines of code, but I guess I thought it's a little bit longer. But this part here, if you're not a developer, bear with me, but for the few developers that are here, you go in and request credentials. It's a very similar to if you interact with Facebook Connect, ask for this information. And here I'm also asking permission to, to send you push notifications. Um, and then once a user accepts that, you, re you get the profile back. And with this, you can go in and attest some kind of credential. So imagine you are a, uh, a uh, cryptocurrency exchange or a bank. Here you could go in and create this signed attestation about the average account balance. And this will now automatically get signed and sent to the user via a push notification. So this is a very simple example. Um, there are people experimenting with doing like weekly updates of average balance and those kinds of things. There's been a lot of creativity in this area. Um, this is actually how um, some, we've had some surprising uh, use cases for this. We originally designed this for the Ethereum market itself because a lot of these Ethereum apps, they need identity. But we got a phone call or an e email probably uh, last summer that the city of Zug in Switzerland, they had some problems with our libraries. And uh, so they basically sent us a, you know, a uh, bug report. And they're saying, city of Zug, what are they doing? And they had basically started working on a city uh, identity system for logging into their uh, city uh, websites. And without talking to us, they just used basically this exact thing to go in and create a process where people first signed up online using the phone, and then they went into a, any city office where and showed a passport and then they would issue 
they would go through this process here and issue a credential that this user is a resident of the city of Two. So this is a this is actually our first real production uh, government use case, and they just figured out how to do it using the libraries, and after a couple of bug reports. But I'm quite proud of those bug reports, though. So. So it's very easy to integrate this, and I encourage anyone to to try it out. You know, if you have any kind of fintech app, uh, if your business, any kind of Ethereum, even Bitcoin. You know, there's nothing here that actually hits the blockchain, hit the Ethereum blockchain. So you can use this with any kind of traditional or blockchain kind of system. So now comes the exciting moment. If you have, as I know you all have, install the app, you can scan this QR code and you will receive this wonderful, really, really important, valuable verification that's only valid to be issued today. Of course, if you're one of the few people who didn't download the app, you can come find me afterwards and I have a QR code, but this QR code will only be valid today. We use absolutely super advanced geolocation technology to ensure that you can take the picture and tweet it out. No, no. <laughs> but this is a proof of concept, really, so you can see the full flow. So what actually will happen here is that once you scan it, it'll come up with a selective disclosure request. We have a very simple server in the back end that takes that request and then signs that attestation. It basically calls that a test credentials call that we saw before and sends it to you as a push notification. Um, so that's really the the end of my talk and I'm happy to take questions. Unfortunately, we are going to have to move on. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, come talk to me. Or um, Esse, who is my colleague. Where is Esse? Esse! Talk to Esse as well. She's awesome. All right. Cool. Thank you very Thanks. much, Pele. Thank you.